The fall of Kabul in August 2021 will certainly be remembered as one of the most pivotal historical moments of the early 21st century. Throughout the 20 years that the US military occupied Afghanistan, the US government spent $2.3 trillion and deployed 980,000 personnel, 20,000 of whom were wounded and 2,455 were killed. Despite all this, Taliban forces managed to hold out, never truly defeated, and swept back through the country once the bulk of American forces had gone home. When Taliban forces launched their final assault on the Afghan capital, iconic photos and videos circulated around the internet of helicopters evacuating personnel from the US Embassy. These were eerily similar to those of the end of the Vietnam War in 1975. At the end of another failed example of US-sponsored state building, these images showed helicopters evacuating personnel from the US Embassy in Saigon as North Vietnamese forces approached. Indeed, some observers noted that at least one of the helicopters which evacuated US Embassy staff in Kabul was likely also used by the US Marines to evacuate staff in Saigon 46 years earlier. However, despite the likelihood of the same airframes being used in both evacuations, the helicopters which rescued Embassy staff in Kabul were not operated by the US Marines. Indeed, they were not operated by any branch of the US military. They were part of a civilian US government organization called the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs Office of Aviation, more commonly known as the Department of State Air Wing, or sometimes just the Air Wing. This organization is far less conspicuous than the US military's aviation branches. However, despite its lack of publicity, this organization is quite sizable, with 100 to 200 plus aircraft in this inventory at any given time. It is also operated in many countries across the globe, mainly in Latin America and the Middle East. For my fellow Australian viewers, that would be just like the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade having its own Air Force, completely separate from the Royal Australian Air Force. So what does the Air Wing do exactly? Well, according to the State Department website, the goals of the Air Wing include eradicating and interdicting illicit drugs, supporting counter-terrorism, building host nation capacities, and conducting counter-narcotics surveillance, among many others. The Air Wing also provides training to pilots and ground crews in host countries. This is so that the Air Wing's aircraft can eventually be turned over to the host country's government. Now, this is a very wide range of missions, and of course, this requires a very wide range of aircraft. Throughout this video, I'll give an overview of some of the aircraft that the Air Wing has operated. However, given the sheer number of aircraft types, this definitely won't be a comprehensive list. So, to look at the Air Wing in more depth, I'm going to go right back to its inception, look at its major deployments, and see how well it has performed in its rather unique role. To understand how the Department of State Air Wing came about, we have to go right back, all the way back to the 1970s. When Richard Nixon was United States President, he declared that one of his main policies would be combating illicit drugs. Until 1972, the vast majority of heroin in the United States came from Turkey. After receiving pressure from the US government, the Turkish government eventually outlawed opium production. However, seeing that a gap in the illicit drug market had emerged, farmers in Mexico started growing both poppies, the plant required to make opiates, and marijuana. This did not go unnoticed, however, and just like they did with Turkey, the US government placed pressure on Mexico to eradicate their opium and marijuana crops. To begin with, Mexican authorities went around manually destroying these crops. However, this proved to be incredibly ineffective. In 1975, the Mexican government started a campaign of aerial spraying. In other words, using aircraft to spray herbicides onto the illicit crops. Now this is where the State Department enters the story. That department was given the responsibility of assisting the Mexican government in its counter-narcotics campaign. To do this, in 1978, the State Department created the Bureau of International Narcotics Matters. The INM assisted the Mexican government by providing financial support and by providing aircraft. One of the first aircraft provided to the Mexican government was the Turbo Thrush Crop Duster. This aircraft was originally designed in the 1950s by Snow Aeronautical and was powered by a single radial engine. However, over the next few decades, its design and manufacturing rights were bought and sold by several companies. Later versions of this aircraft were powered by a variety of turboprop engines. Because it was designed as a crop duster, the turbo thrush was seen as an ideal aircraft to spray herbicides over illicit crops. Later on, the INM also began sending helicopters to the Mexican government. These were the Bell 206 and Bell 212. The Bell 206 Jet Ranger is actually one of the most common helicopters in the world, having been originally designed in the 1960s and adopted by the US Army as the OH-58 Kiowa Observation Helicopter. The Bell 206 can seat five people, including the pilot, and is powered by a single Rolls-Royce Allison 250 turboshaft engine. 
It also boasts one of the best safety records of any helicopter type. As for the Bell 212, this is the twin-engine version of the Bell 205, which is known in military service as the UH-1 Iroquois and is practically synonymous with the Vietnam War. Originally designed and built for the Canadians, the US military ended up using the Bell 212 as well. In particular, the US Marines liked the aircraft as having two engines made it much more reliable when flying over water. When Ronald Reagan became president in 1981, he vowed to fight even harder in the war on drugs, declaring that he would implement a foreign policy that vigorously seeks to interdict and eradicate illegal drugs, wherever cultivated, processed, or transported. After this declaration, even more financial and material support was sent to Mexico. Indeed, between 1980 and 1987, the US government's budget for the war on drugs tripled. However, not everything was going smoothly. Though they were very good at spraying pesticides over crops in the United States, the turbo thrushes were having a few problems down in Mexico. Firstly, the INM had a very hard time finding enough pilots to fly them. This was partly due to the fact that there weren't actually enough pilots down in Mexico who were qualified to fly the turbo thrush. In 1987, a turbo thrush crashed into the side of a mountain, killing both the pilot and the navigator. After this crash, the INM redeployed their turbo thrushes to other countries where illicit crop spraying was taking place. One of those countries was Colombia. Now, to begin with, the aerial spraying campaign in Mexico was actually quite successful. However, in a case of history repeating itself, farmers down in Colombia began to produce marijuana to fill the gap in the market. Just like they did with Turkey and then Mexico, the US government put pressure on Colombia and in 1978, Colombian President Julio Cesar Tobay Ayala agreed to start eradicating marijuana crops in his country. And, just like they did with Mexico, the State Department and the INM oversaw the US government's financial and material support to Colombia. One other aircraft that was sent to Colombia to carry out aerial spraying was the North American OV-10 Bronco. This somewhat unusual looking aircraft was designed to conduct counterinsurgency operations, both by attacking ground forces directly and providing forward air control to other attack aircraft. Thanks to its twin turboprop engines and short takeoff performance, it was faster than helicopters but slower than fighter jets, meaning it could carry out missions that neither helicopters nor fast jets could. It served in several branches of the US military and indeed with other countries' air forces as well. With its weapons removed, the Bronco has also undertaken missions in the civilian world, such as aerial mapping and, of course, aerial spraying. In fact, the aircraft can carry nearly 1,500 kilograms of cargo in the fuselage behind the cockpit. Other features that made the Bronco suitable for operations in the rugged Colombian countryside were its sturdy landing gear, ability to start its engines with no extra ground equipment, and the fact that its engines could run on regular automotive petrol if jet fuel was unavailable. However, despite all the money and resources being provided, the aerial spraying campaign in Colombia wasn't exactly going according to plan either. After President Ayala agreed to start eradicating marijuana crops in his country, the farmers then switched to growing coca, the plant required to make cocaine. So why did they switch from marijuana to cocaine? Well, Colombian drug smugglers realized that cocaine was both harder to detect and much, much more profitable. Indeed, cocaine production in Colombia actually increased during the 1980s, despite the counter-narcotics campaign. It was also around this time that left-wing guerrilla groups in Colombia started gaining serious power and influence. For example, the Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia, or FARC, started selling and trafficking cocaine as a way to fund their guerrilla war. FARC eventually became so powerful that the Colombian military struggled to take them on in open battle. In 1994, Colombia elected a new president, Ernesto Samper. With the crisis in his country worsening, Samper vowed to eradicate all coca crops in Colombia within two years. The same year, the US government convinced Samper to allow their own aircraft to take part in the aerial spraying campaign. After this agreement was reached, the State Department then deployed its own fleet of turbo thrushes and broncos to supplement those operated by the Colombians. State Department operations began in 1995, using San Jose del Guaviare Municipal Airport as its base. Now that the State Department's own aircraft had joined the fight, the aerial spraying campaign became much more effective. In fact, these aircraft caused so much damage to Colombia's coca crops that FARC began offering a $200,000 bounty for every spraying aircraft that was shot down. In 2000, the campaign was stepped up even further with the implementation of Plan Colombia. This was a joint US-Colombian operation designed to destroy guerrilla groups by taking out the illicit drug economy. Of course, aerial spraying played a huge part in this operation. Plan Colombia saw $6 billion of aid provided to Colombia and allowed 800 US military personnel and 300 civilian contractors to help train the Colombian military and police. However, ground fire still posed a serious threat to aerial spraying aircraft. 
To deal with this threat, the spraying aircraft began to operate alongside the Colombian Army's counter-narcotics battalions. Trained by US Special Forces, these Colombian Army units would first secure the target crop and then clear the area of enemy forces, which allowed the spraying aircraft to carry out its mission without the risk of being shot down. Though most of the State Department's counter-narcotics aid was sent to Mexico and Colombia, other states in Latin America also received financial and material assistance, including Panama, Peru, Guatemala, Honduras, and Bolivia. Also, crop dusters weren't the only type of aircraft that the State Department sent to Latin America. Operating fleet of aircraft in a foreign country requires a very effective logistical chain. So, in order to get supplies from the United States to their various bases in Latin America, the State Department had its own fleet of cargo aircraft, including the Fairchild C-123 Provider and the Convair C-131 Samaritan. The C-123 Provider actually started life in the late 1940s as a prototype assault glider. An assault glider is an aircraft that gets towed into enemy territory before crash landing and deploying its contingent of soldiers that way. Now, the assault glider prototype didn't quite work out, but it was redesigned as a cargo aircraft powered by two Pratt & Whitney R2800 radial engines. Later versions of the provider had two additional turbojet engines underneath the wings. Unlike many other cargo aircraft at the time, the provider could take off from short, unprepared runways in rugged terrain. This made it an ideal aircraft to service rural airstrips across Latin America. Though it was also powered by two R2800 radial engines, the Convair C-131 Samaritan was actually quite a different aircraft to the provider. Designed in the 1950s, the Samaritan was actually the military designation for the CV-240 series of airliners. While serving in the US Air Force, the Samaritan was mainly used for VIP transport and medical evacuation. So quite different to the missions that the provider carried out. With countless millions of dollars spent since the 1970s and a plethora of aircraft deployed, how effective was the Air Wing's contribution to the war on drugs? Well, when you look at some of the statistics, their campaign looks pretty successful. For example, in 1981, between 300 and 500 tons of marijuana were produced in Mexico, down from between 4,000 and 6,000 tons in 1977. In Colombia, between 1994 and 2011, Colombian and State Department aircraft sprayed around 1.5 million hectares of illicit crops. Of course, these operations were not cheap. In 1989, for example, of the $101 million that the State Department allocated to the INM, $72 million was spent on operations in Latin America. However, there are some other statistics which contradict these successes. Back up in Mexico, after 1981, the amount of marijuana produced began to increase again at a rapid rate. In fact, by 1986, Mexico was producing more marijuana than Colombia. Speaking of Colombia, the number of people cultivating coca in that country also dramatically increased. In the early 1980s, there were 25,000 coca farmers in Colombia, and by the late 1990s, this had risen to 300,000. After Plan Colombia was implemented in 2000, there was a reduction in coca farming, but after 2003, it increased yet again. This was partly due to the fact that coca farmers became better at disguising their crops. Peru was another country that hosted State Department aircraft, but this campaign had lackluster results. In 1984, at the peak of aerial spraying in Peru, less than 4,000 hectares of illicit crops were sprayed. According to one expert, this was less than the total land that was retired from cultivating illicit crops every year. Indeed, the Air Wing's problems in Latin America went further than the issue of crop spraying. In 2013, the Air Wing turned over a batch of helicopters to the Guatemalan government, helicopters which had been operating with the Air Wing since 2008. In 2016, it was found that the government of Guatemala had been unable to sustain the airworthiness of the helicopters that it previously provided. It was also revealed that Guatemalan pilots had to buy their own helmets, and there wasn't enough ammunition for the helicopter's gunners to stay current in their weapons certifications. So, why did the production of marijuana and coca bounce back, and indeed increase, after the State Department got involved? Well, turns out, these aerial spraying campaigns absolutely devastated many local populations. The product that State Department aircraft used against the illicit crops was Roundup, a product which contained several warning labels for a very good reason. In Colombia, there were many reports of cattle and fish dying in the areas where aerial spraying took place. Indeed, many farmers in the area reported serious health problems after these operations began. Also, because the coca crops were often on the same farms as regular food crops, the spraying aircraft would inevitably destroy the food crops as well. In 1996, 8,000 protesters clashed with security forces at Puerto Assis Airport after their food crops were destroyed by aerial spraying. Indeed, many people whose livelihoods were ruined by aerial spraying went even further than just protesting. Many disaffected farmers took up arms against the government and joined various rebel factions. 
Even though the aerial spraying and campaign in Peru was largely unsuccessful, in the mid-1980s, a communist guerrilla army called the Sandero Luminoso, or Shining Path, appeared in that country. They declared that Peru's anti-drug campaign was a tool of US imperialism, and many disgruntled farmers joined their cause. Though many Latin American governments officially supported and indeed welcomed State Department support in the war on drugs, many politicians in those countries actually spoke out against the campaign, after becoming aware of the damage being done. There were attempts to literally bribe coca farmers to destroy their own crops, but all too often, the money allocated for these farmers got lost in corruption. Ultimately, no matter how many aircraft and billions of dollars the State Department sent to Latin America, the war on drugs was, and is, doomed by the socio-economic state of those countries. In his book, More Terrible Than Death, Drugs, Violence, and America's War in Colombia, author Robin Kirk sums up the situation very well. But few had any faith that a legal crop could replace coca. That was a point that Americans never quite seemed to grasp. The farmers didn't plant coca because they wanted to poison America's youth, as the politicians suggested from the floor of the House of Representatives, but because there simply weren't alternatives, subsidised or not. The State Department's aerial operations in the Middle East actually began as an offshoot of the war on drugs in Latin America. After the United States invaded Afghanistan in 2001, they quickly realised that the country was awash with illicit drugs. To try and combat this, in 2002, the State Department deployed some of its aircraft to Pakistan to support that country's border security operations. These operations were designed to control the flow of drugs and weapons across the border with Afghanistan. Two years later, the State Department's Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, or INL, initiated Plan Afghanistan, which was closely modelled on Plan Colombia. In 2005, the State Department Air Wing officially began aerial operations in Afghanistan in support of the counter-narcotics campaign. Now, at this time, the majority of the missions that the Air Wing conducted were transportation for Afghanistan's counter-narcotics police and reconnaissance and protection for teams on the ground who were responsible for eradicating illicit crops. Indeed, it wasn't just the Afghan counter-narcotics police who received support from the Air Wing. The US government's own Drug Enforcement Administration was also active in Afghanistan, and air wing helicopters would often provide close air support and casualty evacuation for DEA officers. A good example of the type of mission that the air wing would perform took place on the 22nd of July 2009, an operation which saw an Afghan border police commander arrested for drug smuggling. This was a joint US-Afghan mission, which involved both Afghan counter-narcotics police and a DEA Foreign Deployed Advisory and Support Team, or FAST. While the Afghan police were deployed by their own MIL MI-17 helicopters, the DEA forces rode in on Bell UH-1 Iroquois operated by the Air Wing. Also, providing overwatch above the whole operation was a Basler BT-67 transport plane. Though several decades old, the UH-1 Iroquois is actually the most common aircraft in the Air Wing's inventory, with 118 of them on the books in 2018. While a lot of the Air Wing's Iroquois are more modern twin-engine versions such as the UH-1N and Bell 214, a large number of them are the old single-engine versions that, as I said earlier, are practically synonymous with the Vietnam War. By the way, when I say synonymous, I mean a lot of the Iroquois in Afghanistan were built between 1966 and 1974. In other words, these helicopters were literally from the Vietnam War. 2009 was a big year of changes for the air wing in Afghanistan. Firstly, the State Department ended all funding for its poppy eradication program, focusing instead on interdiction and alternative development. To take over the counter-narcotics role in Afghanistan, the DEA established its own version of the Air Wing called the Air Interdiction Unit. Though serving the DEA, this unit was actually under the control of the Afghan government and was equipped with eight of the Soviet-built MI-17 helicopters. So, with the DEA and the Afghans in charge of the counter-narcotics campaign, what was the State Department Air Wing going to do in Afghanistan now? Well, in that same year, they started transporting diplomatic personnel around the country. In fact, this was the first time in its history that the Air Wing had performed missions which weren't related to counter-narcotics. However, because the Air Wing's role had shifted to personnel transport, they were going to need some new aircraft. The two main aircraft that the Air Wing purchased for these flights were the Beechcraft 1900D and the de Havilland Canada DHC-8. The Beechcraft 1900D is a twin turboprop regional airliner which can carry 19 passengers and has a maximum speed of 524 kilometers an hour. While the original Beech 1900 first flew in 1982, the 1900D is an enhanced version with a taller cabin, allowing passengers to fully stand up inside the aircraft. Another optional feature on the 1900D is an active noise control system. 
This system uses sound waves inside the cabin to counteract the noise coming from the two Pratt & Whitney PT6 engines. In other words, the entire cabin becomes its own set of noise cancelling headphones. As for the DHC-8, this is another twin turboprop regional airliner that originated in the early 1980s. More commonly known as the Dash 8, this aircraft is a bit larger than the 1900D, but does serve in a similar role. Since the Dash 8 first flew in 1983, it has been modified into larger, more powerful versions which can carry more passengers. The Dash 8 300 version, which is what the State Department operated in Afghanistan, is 11.3 feet longer than the original aircraft and can carry 50 to 56 passengers. Despite the huge military presence in that country, throughout the 2010s, the security situation in Afghanistan was slowly getting worse and worse. Even the streets of Kabul were becoming too dangerous for American personnel to pass through. According to Lara Logan, reporting for CBS News, Kabul is so dangerous, American diplomats and soldiers are not allowed to use the roads. They can't just drive two miles from the airport to US headquarters. They have to fly. This is how Embassy Air started. With Kabul's roads becoming too dangerous, the State Department decided that helicopters were the safest mode of transport between the airport and the embassy. The distance between those two locations was around three kilometers and a one-way flight was around five minutes. So not a very long flight at all. However, five to six flights would be conducted five to six days per week and around 150 people would be transported every day. During the 2017 fiscal year, Embassy Air conducted 32,000 flights and transported 36,000 passengers. When the State Department decided to transport diplomatic staff by air, they of course had to choose which helicopters would carry out this mission. The air wing itself chose the Sikorsky S-61T. Given the fact that this aircraft started life as an anti-submarine helicopter, this may seem like a bizarre choice, until you know its whole history. Designed in the late 1950s and with the military designation of SH-3 Sea King, this was one of the first helicopters to be powered by turboshaft engines instead of the old piston engines. It also had a very early form of autopilot, with the helicopter being able to keep a still hover at 50 feet above the water. This was very useful when dipping its sonar into the water to search for submarines. The Sea King could also carry torpedoes, meaning it could both search for and attack enemy submarines. Seeing how successful this helicopter was, in the early 1960s, Sikorsky modified the Sea King into a civilian version. This version had all of its weapons and sensor equipment removed, was stretched by 1.3 meters, and could accommodate up to 30 passengers. Ultimately, this evolved into the more modern Sikorsky S-61T. In 2010, the Air Wing officially requested 15 S-61Ts for its embassy air operations. However, the State Department itself had a different idea. This was the Boeing Vertol CH-46E Sea Knight. Coming in a few years after the Sea King, the Sea Knight was a bit unusual in that it had two main rotors. Unlike the Sea King, the Sea Knight was designed mainly for carrying cargo and soldiers into battle. In fact, it could carry 1,800 kilograms of cargo, or 22 fully armed soldiers inside its cargo hold. The Sea Knight first flew in 1962, and production began two years later. It wasn't long until the US Marines deployed the Sea Knight to Vietnam, where it performed particularly well in transporting goods and personnel between warships and shore bases. It was also involved in rescuing thousands of wounded soldiers from the battlefield. The Sea Knight proved such a versatile design that production didn't end until 1990, and it was still in US military service during the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Though it was formally known as the CH-46 Sea Knight, its crews affectionately referred to it as the Frog, spelt with a PH for some strange reason. Around the time that the State Department Air Wing was searching for embassy air helicopters, the US Marines were starting to replace their Sea Knights with the new MV-22 Osprey tilt rotor transport aircraft. Seeing a potential bargain, the State Department purchased 17 of these former US Marine helicopters. However, by now, these helicopters were getting quite old. To bring them up to modern standards, in 2017, the Air Wing sent them to Southeast Aerospace, an aviation maintenance and modification company based in Melbourne, Florida. Southeast Aerospace made several modifications, including the installation of missile warning and countermeasure systems, as well as a satellite tracking and communication suite. Even though their job was to transport civilian diplomatic staff, the Sea Knights were armed with two M240D belt-fed machine guns, one in each door on the side of the cabin. In Embassy Air Service, the Sea Knight had a crew of between 3 and 5 and could carry 17 passengers. It should also be noted that, even though the State Department bought the Sea Knights for Embassy Air, the request for S61Ts was eventually fulfilled when the State Department bought several of these helicopters in 2015. So what happened to them? Well, of course, they went straight into storage at Patrick Air Force Base in Florida. 
It should come as no surprise that moving hundreds of people every week via helicopter can get a bit expensive. In 2018, each Embassy Air flight was costing the US government $1,350. Now, when you multiply that by how many Embassy Air flights were taking place, that starts to get very expensive. A lot of this had to do with the fact that Embassy Air operations were carried out by a private contractor, but I'll go into that later. In 2021, it was noted that a new type of helicopter had been added to the Air Wing's inventory in Afghanistan. This was the Sikorsky HH-60 Pavehawk. Now, if that name sounds familiar, it's because the helicopter is based on the very well-known UH-60 Blackhawk. Essentially, the HH-60 is a version of the UH-60 that incorporates the PAVE electronic system and is primarily used for combat search and rescue missions. The Pavehawk is equipped with a weather radar and anti-icing systems on its engines and rotor blades, meaning that it can operate in freezing weather conditions. The Air Wing's Pavehawks also feature decoy flare launchers in the tail boom and have more antennae than their military counterparts. In recent years, the United States Army has been replacing its HH-60 Pavehawks with the newer HH-60M model, meaning that once again, the Air Wing has been able to source cheaper aircraft from military surplus. The Air Wing's Pavehawks were first observed in April 2021, when Secretary of State Anthony Blinken visited Afghanistan. It's not known exactly when they entered service with the Air Wing, although Joseph Trevithick, writing for the War Zone, estimates that these would have been delivered between 2019 and 2021. Though these new helicopters provided the Air Wing with an increase in capability, their mission in Afghanistan was about to come to an end. After the majority of US forces pulled out of Afghanistan in the summer of 2021, the Taliban launched an all-out offensive against the Afghan government. Within a few weeks, they had managed to take control over the majority of the country, with the Afghan military collapsing before them. On Sunday 15th of August, the Taliban entered Kabul, encountering almost no resistance. As the Taliban approached Kabul, US government personnel knew that they only had a short time frame to get out of Afghanistan, and so the Air Wing was tasked with carrying out one final mission. Get all diplomatic personnel to Hamid Karzai International Airport, where they could then board US Air Force transport planes out of the country. At the time of the evacuation, the Air Wing had seven sea nights operating in Kabul. The final embassy air flight occurred on Sunday the 15th of August, the day the Taliban entered Kabul. On August 31st, the last American forces left Kabul airport, finally ending their 20-year war in Afghanistan. Just a few hours later, Taliban forces entered the airport. Following them was Nabi Bulos, a Los Angeles Times reporter who then accompanied a Taliban Special Forces unit as they inspected the equipment left behind by NATO forces. This video, taken by Bulos, shows the State Department's sea nights at their final resting place. However, according to the State Department, those sea nights had been, quote, rendered inoperable, unquote. Afghanistan was not the only place where Embassy Air operated. Over in Iraq, Embassy Air also flew State Department personnel, under the very original name of Embassy Air Iraq. Remember earlier when I mentioned the Sikorsky S61Ts? Well, these were eventually put to use in Iraq, and were used not only for transportation, but also for ambush overwatch and medivac operations. Just like they did in Kabul, Air Wing aircraft also ferried diplomatic personnel between Baghdad International Airport and the US Embassy. However, they also operated from smaller bases in Erbil, Basra, and Amman in Jordan. Alongside the S-61s, the Air Wing also operated UH-1N Iroquois, these being the military version of the Bell 212, which they used back in Latin America. One other aircraft that I should talk about here is the Basler BT-67. I mentioned this one earlier when talking about counter-narcotics operations in Afghanistan, but what is it exactly? Well, if you look at this aircraft and thought, Hey, that looks like a Douglas DC-3. Well, you're pretty much right. The BT-67 is actually a DC-3, or C-47, which has been heavily upgraded. In 1990, Basler Turbo Conversions was established at Whitman Regional Airport in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. The purpose of this company was to take existing DC-3s and bring them up to modern standards. The biggest part of this upgrade is replacing the DC-3's old radial engines with Pratt & Whitney Canada PT-6 turboprop engines, complete with five-blade propellers. Other modifications include lengthening and strengthening the fuselage, replacing the wingtips, and installing modern avionics, including a weather radar. As a result of the longer fuselage and new engines, the BT-67 can carry 42% more cargo weight than the original DC-3. Not only has the BT-67 taken part in counter-narcotics operations in Afghanistan, but it also had a rather secretive posting to Libya. In 2011, shortly after the Gaddafi regime fell, an Air Wing BT-67 was sent to Libya and was tasked with transporting a security support team, a unit of roughly 16 commandos whose job it was to protect diplomatic staff. 
However, controversy arose when one of these aircraft was taken away from Libya once regular commercial flights resumed in that country. This happened shortly before the September 2011 attack on the US diplomatic post in Benghazi. Now, despite the vast numbers of diplomatic personnel transported and numerous counter-narcotics operations, the Air Wing has faced its fair share of controversy over the years. In September 2018, the Office of Inspector General conducted an audit of the Air Wing. This audit revealed that many operations went ahead without formal approval. According to the audit, the department is not consistently administering its aviation program in accordance with federal requirements or department guidelines. Specifically, OIG found instances in which significant aviation operations were undertaken without the knowledge or approval of the AGB. The AGB in question is the Aviation Governing Board, the State Department group which is responsible for providing oversight of aviation activities, including approving policies, budgets, and strategic plans. From September 2013 to August 2017, the Air Wing operated a base in Cyprus. The purpose of this base was to provide support for the hypothetical evacuation of the US Embassy in Beirut, Lebanon, if that became necessary. Neither the opening nor closing of this base were approved by the AGB, and according to the audit, the State Department could have saved nearly $71 million in potentially unnecessary expenditures had a cost-benefit analysis been prepared. This was just one of several operations that went ahead without approval from the AGB. When I started researching for this video, I read a statistic that didn't quite make sense at first, a statistic that I actually mentioned at the beginning of this video. Depending on the year, the Air Wing's inventory of aircraft fluctuates between 100 and 200 plus. Yet, the Air Wing only has 60 employees. How can an organization with so many aircraft taking part in so many operations across the world only have 60 employees? Well, for many years, most of the personnel who carried out Air Wing operations were not actually employed by the State Department. The State Department contracted a private military company called DynCorp to carry out its worldwide operations. What we know today as DynCorp started out in 1946 as an air transport, maintenance, and spare parts company. Over the next few decades, this company branched out into other areas such as commercial electronics, data management, energy services, and construction. It also underwent several name changes, but formally became DynCorp in 1987. In 1998, the State Department contracted DynCorp to carry out its worldwide counter-narcotics missions. Part of the reason why the State Department relied upon DynCorp contractors to fly their aircraft in Latin America was that if these aircraft were shot down, there would be far less public and media outcry than if uniformed US military personnel were killed. As I mentioned earlier, the US government put a cap on the number of US personnel allowed to be deployed to Colombia. However, after George W. Bush took over as US president in 2000, his administration found a way around this rule. Even though there was a maximum of 300 civilian contractors allowed in the country, DynCorp hired a large number of pilots who were not US citizens. This meant that even though DynCorp had 335 contractors in Colombia, only a third were actually US citizens, meaning that technically they were well under the cap of 300 contractors. As their operations in Latin America and the Middle East were running so well, in 2005, DynCorp was awarded a new performance-based contract and over the next four years, they received $1.07 billion from the State Department. However, the use of DynCorp did land the State Department in a bit of hot water from time to time. In 2010, the Pakistani Interior Minister Rehman Malik had claimed on multiple occasions that there were no US private military contractors operating in Pakistan. However, shortly after he made these claims, the US government formally requested land in Pakistan for DynCorp to carry out aviation maintenance. This directly contradicted Malik's claim that there were no American PMCs operating in Pakistan. A 2010 report from the Office of Inspector General claimed that the performance-based contract under which DynCorp is operating in Afghanistan has created management challenges for INLA. In particular, the contract lacks clearly defined requirements, makes oversight of specific aspects of contractor performance difficult, and lacks effective cost control measures to prevent cost overruns. And the contractor, DynCorp, has been unable to meet the required number of flying hours in Pakistan. It should be noted that that same report also stated, despite these shortcomings, DynCorp performed fairly well in Afghanistan, adhering to the rules of engagement and flying many successful missions. However, despite being renewed so many times, the State Department's contract with DynCorp wasn't going to last forever. In September 2016, the State Department awarded an 11 and a half year contract worth $10 billion to a company called AAR Airlift, thus ending the 20 plus year contract with DynCorp. 
AAR had actually existed for over 60 years before they won this new contract. Indeed, they had already been contracted to conduct logistical operations for many governments and defence clients in the Middle East and Africa. Now, as you would expect, DynCorp did not take this decision well. In December 2016, DynCorp went to the Court of Federal Claims. They argued that AAR Airlift had poached DynCorp employees who had worked on air wing operations to ensure that AAR would win the new contract. However, in late 2017, the Court of Federal Claims upheld the State Department's decision to award the new contract to AAR Airlift. In September 2020, DynCorp itself finally came to an end when it was bought by Amentum, another private military company. So, what's so bad about DynCorp, you might be asking? They embarrassed a Pakistani politician and had some difficulty operating Afghanistan, but they're not that bad of a company, right? Well, there's a lot more to DynCorp than their operations with the State Department. In 2016, the US government filed a False Claims Act against DynCorp. This was in relation to a 2004 contract to train the Iraqi police. According to the US government, one of DynCorp's subcontractors overcharged the government for accommodation, translation, security, and other overhead expenses. In August 2017, US President Donald Trump appointed a new chief of staff by the name of John F. Kelly, a former four-star general in the US Marine Corps. Now, shortly after he retired from the military, he was hired by DynCorp where he was paid over $160,000 to be an advisor. While Kelly worked for DynCorp, one of its subsidiaries won a $700,000 contract with the Department of Homeland Security. This all seems quite innocent, until he realised that Kelly was later nominated to become head of the Department of Homeland Security. Now, swindling money from the US government and doing shady political deals is a pretty bad look for a company. But trust me, it gets worse. In the late 1990s, DynCorp was operating in Bosnia, supporting the US military's peacekeeping mission in that country. Two DynCorp employees discovered that many of their colleagues were engaging in the trafficking and abuse of child prostitutes, often confiscating their passports so they couldn't escape. Of course, the two whistleblowers were promptly fired by DynCorp, and as for the men who were trafficking and abusing these children, DynCorp got them safely out of the country where they were immune from prosecution. So. You have a company which not only swindles money from the US government and puts people in government positions where they can secure more contracts, but you also have a company which facilitates child abusers. This is the company that the State Department hired to oversee its aerial operations across the world for more than 20 years. Now, this is the time of the video where we bring everything together. So to answer the question of the video, why does the State Department have its own Air Force? The answer is, I don't know. <laughs> That's probably not the answer you're looking for, but in all seriousness, I can't really figure the answer out myself. Now, I've reviewed the whole script and tried to think of some logical conclusion to this whole story. Unfortunately, I just don't have one. I think the reason why is the fact that the Department of State Air Wing itself doesn't really have that much of a coherent story. In fact, that's the reason I didn't even write a script for this final part. Now, in my opinion, transporting diplomatic personnel around Iraq and Afghanistan, it makes sense that the State Department would have its own fleet of aircraft. But then this begs the question, well, why didn't they just use US military assets? I mean, throughout the years that the US military occupied both Iraq and Afghanistan, they had a plethora of their own aircraft. I'm sort of wondering to myself, well, why didn't the State Department just use those assets? I'm sure there is a good reason for it. I just don't know what that answer is. If we go right back to the beginning of the war on drugs, the fact that the State Department provided aircraft to the governments of Mexico, Colombia, and a few others, again, I think that does actually make sense. What doesn't make sense to me is why the State Department eventually sent their own fleet of aircraft to Latin America when the DEA has its own fleet of aircraft for the same mission. One other kind of vague narrative that I picked up while researching for this story is this idea that State Department air wing operations and the use of subcontractors kind of feeds into this whole neoliberal idea that outsourcing is actually the most efficient way to do business. Now, in this video, I'm not going to comment on whether, you know, it should be the government doing this or whether they should outsource everything, but you can't avoid the fact that by outsourcing a lot of their operations to DynCorp, a lot of money got lost in what is essentially corporate greed. You've got DynCorp, who have often basically embezzled money from the US government. And if, at one point, you've got to ask yourself the question, were they actually better off going with a private contractor? Or would there have been much greater accountability had, say, the DEA done this, or if the State Department had used its own assets to conduct these aerial operations? So to try and 
bring a kind of coherent end to this story. I think that the story of the State Department air wing is an example of a government bureaucracy which, like so many other government bureaucracies, lacks direction. There's not a whole lot of direction going on in terms of what the air wing is supposed to be doing exactly. There are countless, countless government bureaucracies that have the same problem, especially when you have a mission that could possibly be taken over by so many departments, like for example, uh, the war on drugs, you know, you've got the State Department, which was providing aid to other countries, but it was to do with counter-narcotics, so the DEA could have taken care of that as well. So essentially what happened was the Air Wing started out providing financial and material support to these governments, but over time the mission changed in a way that it actually was quite different to what they initially set out to do. Let's go back to the early to mid 70s, you've got the State Department and the INM providing financial and material support until the occupation of Afghanistan where they're transporting you know, these DEA teams in there, they're providing overwatch. Their mission has extended well beyond what they're originally supposed to be doing. They've set out to do one mission and just slowly morphed into something else. And that <laughs> that's the best way that I can sum up this whole story. Where they go after the fall of Kabul, I'm not entirely certain, maybe another five or ten years, I'll make another video on this topic. Well, I think that just about wraps it up for this video. Thanks very much for sticking around to the end of this. I've just started work on another research project. It is on an aviation topic, probably won't be out for quite a while though, so in the meantime, you're just gonna have to put up with videos of me playing guitar and occasionally building a model airplane. If you want to see where I got my information for this video, in the end credits I'm gonna put a list of all my references, but down in the description I'm also gonna put a link to a document with all my references in there. Now of course it's time for the obligatory request slash demand that you head down there hit the like and subscribe button, all that kind of jazz. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Again, I think that does actually make sense. <laughs> oh, hello. Sorry, my, my, uh, sorry, my, my kitty, my, my, my little pussy cat just decided to come in and say hi. So normally I don't like it when my videos get interrupted, but it's okay when you come in. Hmm? Her name's Luna, by the way. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, down you go. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Luna. Okay.